Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Hagley Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these History Hangouts, we like to share with you some of the great work being done by researchers using the historical collections at the Hagley Library, especially folks who have received support from the Hagley Center in the form of research grants and fellowships. One such scholar joining me today is Dr. Jeffrey Muldoon. Associate Professor at the School of Business at Emporia State University. Jeff, thank you for joining me today. Excited to be here. That's great. Well, let's begin with the big picture. What is your research about? So what um, my research question is, is what type of CSR policies did DuPont have from, we'll say 1900 to the start of World War II? And by, corp, uh, by um, wealth, welfare capitalism, what I'm talking about is a series of policies that are designed um, to help workers, such as stock options, bonuses, uh, granting mortgages, um, sports teams, um, and, and the like. And I'm curious about not only what um, stages those programs took, but also the ideology behind those programs. And what was that acronym again? I missed it. Um, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. I see. Corporate Social Responsibility. And um, so you're examining this in DuPont. And what collections at Hagley were you digging into to help you uncover the story? The biggest one that I got the most from was the John J. Roscoe papers, which was just monumental. Um, he kept everything. Um, the thing I got about the Hagley sports teams, which they had a baseball team, um, I actually got from the Roscoe papers. And he actually had um, scores. I don't think the DuPont had a good baseball team, but that's besides the point. He had uh, records of it, and he had records of dances that DuPont would have. And he also had a very long correspondence with one of the authors of the time, a man named Samuel Crowther. Um, his books on um, the mutual gains between labor and capitalism are actually still in print. Um, and he had a very long correspondence and they both believe that corporations had a role to play um, with workers, that there was not exploitation, but a real partnership between both. And organizations that developed this partnership um, would thrive and workers mm -hmm. would thrive. So rather than viewing this as a lose-lose game um, or a win-lose game, they saw this as a win-win game and developing conditions that would allow corporations and workers to benefit from each other. Hmm. Was this part of a wider movement at that time or was DuPont yes. out leading this? Hmm. Well, DuPont was out leading this, but this hmm. is part of a wider movement. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, people have not paid enough attention to DuPont um, service on this, which is interesting given DuPont um, is such a prominent corporation at the time. Um, there's been books written on DuPont, um, the DuPont brothers, uh, how they took over the company. Roscoe was a very famous individual, but a lot of times, a lot of the corporate social, uh, a lot of the corporate welfare slash CSR at the time literature focuses on the National Cash Register Company, hmm. um, Ford, dozens and dozens of articles and books on Ford, um, General Electric to a certain extent, and of course, um, the telephone company, AT&T. So I don't think enough people have spent enough attention on um, DuPont's role in this. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what, um, was, what was this, the object of this movement? You sort of mentioned that the theoretical underpinning is that labor and capital share um, mm -hmm. uh, a partnership. Um, what, was, what was the purpose? What was um, the, the main thrust of this CSR? I think there was a program? strike every day or no, mm -hmm. every four days in the United States at the time. Mm -hmm. Destruction of property was widespread. Theft was widespread. People not working their full time was widespread. Strike breakers were widespread. And there are all these different approaches to meld workers and managers together to tone down um, this conflict. Um, one of the most common um, that was done was initially bullying workers, hiring cops and Pinkertons and state militia to beat up employees. Indeed, there was one 
um, steel company in Pennsylvania that had a larger police force than the, than the Pennsylvania State Police. Mm. As you can see, that was not very attractive and it was very self-defeating. Mm. So like you're a worker, you don't believe you're being treated fairly. You're stealing from, this, from, from the organization. My cops beat you up. You're not going to work much longer for us. You're, 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 there's nothing to do to make restitution mm. and your friends are going to get back at the company in some way. So from that standpoint, a bullying approach doesn't work. What corporate welfare did, or uh, welfare capitalism, was a movement both in the United States and Great Britain that would give workers things to aid and help um, as a sign of a compensation. It was like the benefits um, that workers received back in the day. Indeed, um, healthcare was one of the benefits of welfare capitalism. The um, companies would give um, insurance to employees. And like DuPont, they'd also get bonuses for outstanding work effort. effort. Um, and as such, it was very um, dynamic and it, it toned down um, the issues between labor and, and, um, and management. Indeed, I don't think DuPont had a labor union until late into the 50s. Um, so it obviously worked. They had a very thriving company. People were happy. And if you look at the archives, there are lots of examples where DuPont actually helped workers find homes. They would pay mortgages. They would pay for workers' um, medical bills. So it was very extensive um, what they did. And it was um, truly interesting, um, its scope. Um, for example, one of the mm -hmm. things that they did that I think it warrants a paper on its own was DuPont was one of the leaders in safety. They actually mm -hmm. had safety competitions and how not to do certain things like don't carry around in uh, hot, hot <laughs> liquid and jiggle it. Um, if you're using a ladder, don't carry up the hot liquid. Um, there was like um, a game they would have where you point out everything that's unsafe in a in a poster. And they actually had poster competitions. So mm -hmm. to me, that was extremely fascinating that they did this. And it just indicates just how forward thinking management was at the time and how similar their discourse was to current management. Mm. And I suppose uh, the company is keeping a very close eye on the bottom line. And perhaps would this indicate that uh, having a baseball team and occasionally helping with um, uh, family expenses of your workers perhaps that's much less expensive than maintaining a private paramilitary force. Yeah, it is. And it makes your workers work better. Um, there's something in, uh, I think, a line of literature in CSR that's not talked about um, is the transaction costs of it. Mm -hmm. um, transaction cost economics is one of the dominant paradigms in economics. Um, I'm a business professor as well as a person that does history. And uh, one of the things we talk about is, is transaction costs. And every time at work that you do not do work or you're pursuing your own interest, that adds cost to the company. Mm -hmm. And if I treat you well, either I'd make a social relationship with you by, by being on the baseball team, or if, I, or if I give you something to buy a home, or if I give you a bonus for excellent work, what I'm doing is, is why I'm spending money, the benefit from spending that money will be offset by the increases in production. Right. Because I'm giving you money and giving you things and treating you well, you're going to respond in turn. Mm -hmm. So this is not pure altruism. It makes business sense. You know, mm -hmm. this is not to say that the DuPonts or Roscoe, Walter Carpenter were bad people or, or they were or they were manipulative or anything like that. They just offer their workers say, hey, work hard. You get a bonus. Work hard. You get promoted work hard, you get trained. And that workers like that. And mm -hmm. as a result of that, um, companies like DuPont, Ford, um, AT&T, um, National Cash Register actually were high performing. Hmm. Yeah, that was my next question. Uh, can you compare uh, perhaps the outcomes uh, financially between firms that embrace this management technique and those that didn't? Um, yeah, the team firms that were primarily forward thinking outperformed those that were not. Mm. Um, and even firms that were not forward thinking because of issues um, related to 
um, violence would actually pursue um, welfare capitalism type issues or welfare capitalism type responses. Mm -hmm. One of those was Standard Oil, which by the time this happens, it was broken up into multiple companies, but they had an approach that say did, well, you know, if workers don't work, let's break the strikes. Let's get heavy handed. And then there was something called the Ludwell Massacre, mm -hmm. which was in 1915, 1916. And it made the company look bad. And John D. Rockefeller Jr. was like, we can't do this anymore. And he went into industrial research and spent a small fortune on industrial research to find better management techniques. So this was actually really forward thinking. Um, the extent to which companies did this um, is probably debatable. Um, I don't know if we have the evidence to really um, gear into it, but I imagine every company in the United States or every major company at least gave lip service to it. Hmm. Now this might be somewhat outside the scope or certainly outside the scope of your chronology, but might your research have any implications for a political economy um, of the contemporary moment, a uh, relationship between uh, workers and management today? So in many ways, the issues between workers and management proliferate. It's the same old debate that has been since the establishment of free labor. Workers today are not as destructive. They don't, theft doesn't occur as much. But one of the biggest drivers of cost is this idea that I'm going to take a break from work. There's various measures to indicate this. And I think the United States loses about $600 billion per year in workers not doing their job at work. So let's take, for example, um, myself. I go into work. I sit down at my desk. I read the newspaper online. I'm on my phone. I'm on Skype. That's all preventing worker productivity. That's all limiting the productivity of workers and uh, or, or all limiting the productivity of the company. And that's a very common thing. And it's common in our corporations that are very heavy handed, that do not have engaged supervisors and do not provide adequate incentives to employees. Hmm. You know, have you ever seen the movie Office Space? It's a, it's a classic movie. Um, mm -hmm. It's still mm -hmm. relevant. It's the character in it says, why should I work hard so that they could sell another 10,000 units. There's no benefit to it, to me. And the way to get rid of that is, that attitude is to give a bonus for performance hmm. because it gives them a financial incentive. And that was the same idea roughly that DuPont and other corporations had at the time. So it's timeless. Now mm -hmm. about CSR, there's something very interesting and this is why I wanna to go to Hagley again. Um, my last day at going through the archives, and I did something very smart. I brought my wife with me. So I would go through the papers and say, scan this, scan this. So I'd be going through a lot of papers at, at once, just like recognizing stuff. And we got 3,000 documents. But something I discovered that I didn't scan, but I want to, was DuPont was actually a leader in chemical warfare. Mm. Now, I'm not saying this is nefarious or bad. It's now bad, but it wasn't bad at the time. In fact, mm. this would have been considered a CSR policy because it has a social impact. Hmm. So they were part of a larger group of people that were designing chemical weapons, defenses for chemical weapons, this association. And it made sense because if you look at literature in the 1930s, people were afraid of gas, of a town city being destroyed by a major gas attack. It was everyone's fear, and it would all come from the airplanes. They would drop canisters and wipe out a population. So companies felt they had the need to develop defenses to it, um, remedies to it, or de design better chemical weapons so that a country would not use their chemical weapons because they could be responded in kind and maybe even worse. And that was the CSR idea at the time because it, really sprung to national defense. But as time changed, the idea of using chemical weapons became more and more unacceptable. And it became more and more a lockdown. And companies that were chemical weapons providers in the 60s onward were denounced. Indeed, it was considered anti-CSR. Hmm. So that's an example of how CSR changes from time to time. Although some of this stuff is timeless and relevant, 
it changes as as um, as people's attitudes change. That's very interesting. Now, something else that's really interesting about um, this story is the uh, the social aspect of um, management trying to put a face on the company and that uh, that is uh, can be a friend of the worker. Um, I'm, thinking here particularly about these benefits that aren't strictly financial, like you mentioned sports teams or perhaps social clubs and events. Uh, could you perhaps unpack that for me a little bit and explain? Sure. Uh, yeah, what, what, why is it in the financial interest of DuPont to have a baseball team or dances, for instance? Well, one of the key aspects of management is this idea of socialization. Hmm. So, you're a nameless, faceless coworker at DuPont when you and I are both working together. I don't know who you are. I don't care who you are. I don't care about your family. I don't feel like I'm responsible to you. But because we work in the same corporation, we do have responsibilities to each other. But again, you're nameless and faceless. And let's say hypothetically, we're both on the same baseball team. We talk, we talk about baseball strategy, Maybe our spouses get to know each other. Maybe you get to meet my dogs. You become more and more of a face, more and more of a person. Now I feel like I have an obligation to you and I know who you are. So it makes people into people. It takes them from that role of coworker or manager or subordinate and makes them into real people, which means because human beings are social animals, we have a responsibility to them. Indeed, because these things are often fun, it also leads to satisfaction with the corporation, which is actually then going to in turn lead to performance. So that's an example of how important sports teams were and are to um, corporations. Indeed, um, one of the best women's softball teams in the country is the Ray Bestas Brickettes from the Ray, Ray Bestas Breaks company. And they actually are still in existence while Ray Bestas either went out of business or left Milford or Bridgeport, Connecticut, where they were located. Mm. It created a legacy. Um, if you play for the Briquettes, you were a great player. So, you know, that's something also to, it adds to the allure of a corporation. And it seems uh, in that way, quite a reaction uh, against the bureaucratization of uh, the corporation, especially corporations like DuPont, which are growing into these very large and very complex organizations that can be um, uh, anonymizing uh, for the for people. Yeah, and it, it's tricky because when you have um, when you have hierarchies, bureaucracy, you can't consider every aspect of the of bureaucracy or, or hierarchy. There's always something missed because people are not completely rational. We don't operate under complete information. Mm -hmm. So modern management actually states the managers have to get performance out of employees above and beyond um, that of what the work contract is. And they often urge to be develop certain leadership techniques, whether it's servant leadership, leader member exchange, um, transformational leadership, charismatic leadership to induce them to do more. And that type of socialization is important because it allows people to be connected to something that's not a nameless, faceless corporation. You know, imagine if you went to work, you know, probably everyone at, at the Hagley Library, you kind of probably associate with them. You, you seem like you have a group of people, but imagine you're in a corporation or a library that's even larger. Let's say you have DuPont's records and a hundred other large companies and a thousand executives records. And this library is gigantic. Let's just say instead of being where you're at, it expands and takes over the city of Wilmington. Just this one gigantic archive of, of materials. Would you as a program director know what's going on in something other than the DuPont area? And would you feel responsibility if you were dealing with the Rockefeller papers or advertising that you have the Rockefeller papers? Mm -hmm. would, you would stretch. Do, yeah, you would do that if you knew the hell of the Rockefeller papers. So that's why the socialization is important. Mm -hmm. And 
Now I'm, now I'm curious about uh, your job teaching in a business school. Do you bring these historical insights in to bear um, in the classroom when you're educating and training future business leaders? Well, that's interesting. Um, students consider what happened 20 years ago to be ancient history. So. <laughs> Something that happened in the 1920s and 1930s is beyond their consideration. Um, I, I've held letters that people have written to Neville Chamberlain, Franklin Roosevelt, indeed. I have a Roscoe letter to Franklin Roosevelt, and I think I have Roosevelt's response, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, I've looked, held papers by, written by Abraham Lincoln. Um, so these people are alive to me in a way that they're not, but for the average student, they don't really seem to notice this. But I do talk about historical examples. Indeed, um, in my principles of management course, we have a section on history <clears throat> where we talk about how do we know and why do we know it? Mm -hmm. And I think they at times dislike it, but they have to understand that we are here because of a decision made in the past. We're interviewing today because um, the DuPonts and a lot of their executives decided to leave their papers for posterity. Mm -hmm. Let's say Pierre DuPont, Lamont DuPont, and John J. Roscoe said, no, no, let's burn all our papers as we die. And let's burn everything that is in the corporation. Um, that's over 20 years old, or we'll shred it or, or dump it. <coughs> there wouldn't be a haggle. So history plays a key role in how we live, how we work, what we do. And that's important to know. But oftentimes this message is not considered, um, well, how shall I put this, um, obvious to people. Hmm. In 20 years time, if we're still doing Zoom, or Zoom's equivalent. People will have forgotten that Zoom became big because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I mean, I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna break the rules here. <laughs> when did you guys start doing Zoom with historians or people using the library? I'm just curious. When we had to close the library due to the pandemic and mm -hmm. we could no longer interview face-to-face, -face. this program went online. Yeah, did you, did you hear, did you even hear of Zoom before COVID? No, I hadn't. Yeah, neither had I. I mean, I, I was are. familiar with Skype. I was familiar with um, some other programs, Microsoft Teams, but I wasn't familiar with Zoom. Mm -hmm. And COVID changed that. In fact, I taught online using Zoom for a full year. Yeah, uh, I, I did for a, a semester as well. Yeah, I still use Zoom when I um, lecture face-to-face -to -face today. Mm -hmm. um, I record the lecture so students could look at the lecture and see how much of a doofus I made of myself or <laughs> whatnot, but it's because of COVID. And this is forgotten about as you get older and you always have to remind mm -hmm. yourself, why are we doing this? And it's probably because of some historical event. Sure, as uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King said, we are made of history. Yes, yep, and our history, the history of others, the history of the larger context we play in and it, and it plays a key role. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say DuPont was not taken over by Pierre DuPont. Let's say it was taken over by somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's say it would have been Robert DuPont or Robert Smith or someone that's not a DuPont. The nature of that com company would have changed dramatically. You know, it may not have been a family owned company. It may, may have stayed, I think, the, a market based company, or they might have gone into the market, or they might have done different programs, or they might have done entirely different things. But the mm -hmm. fact that DuPont and his, and his cousins, um, I believe, um, had a connection to the founder of the company, they ran the company in a way that was probably different than an outsider would have. Mm -hmm. And because they understood what the company really stood for. Unfortunately, in corporate history, a lot of this is forgotten, smudged over, mm -hmm. um, ignored. And, and though it has profound uh, consequences. Indeed, they have profound consequences. Um, you know, the example that we provide um, in, in the textbooks is, is Walmart. Hmm. Um, Walmart is associated with being cheap. Price, they commit, they compete on price. <clears throat> and 
one of the things about Walmart was, was that when Sam Walton formed the company, he would stay at the cheapest motel. So he'd stay at Motel 6 or, or Super 8. You know, those were called 6 and 8 because it was $6 a night a long time ago. Even when he became a billionaire, indeed, I believe he died the world's richest person, he would still stay at the cheapest hotel to remind himself where he came from. Hmm. And Walmart today, their executives still do this, even though they could afford to expand, stay at more expensive places. Um, they could, um, they could, um, they could, they they still stay at the cheapest because they want to maintain true to the vision of the company. Hmm. But Walmart's very aggressive. Sam Walton wasn't that aggressive. Indeed, he really focused in on helping communities, whereas Walmart has a reputation of destroying communities. So sometimes the message of the founder is not communicated completely. Hmm. Yeah, sounds like uh, you know, staying in the motel is a bit of a fig leaf. Yeah, but it's still important to you know conceptualize. I mean, in terms of keeping price down, yeah, that still matters. But Walton's vision was a little bit more nuanced than hmm. mm-hmm. just let's sell everything as cheap as possible. Now, a, f- a final question for you. Um, what advice might you give to folks who are looking at doing research in a business archive, perhaps especially at the Hagley Library, who are unfamiliar with using business records for archival research? So first thing is, if you're going to go use business stuff, depending upon what business stuff you're using, it would help to understand what something is. So if you're looking at Hagley's balance sheet, Mm. you have to be not DuPont's balance sheet. Mm -hmm. If you guys have there some sort of financial numbers, you just have to be aware of the principles of accounting and finance. You don't need to be an expert in it, but you at least have to have some passing fancy or know someone who has a passing fancy in it. Um, The other side of the coin is, is that I would recommend reading as much as you can about the company before you go into the archive. looking at the um, records of the archive, um, looking at what papers are available in the archive. And then the other thing I would suggest is you have a limited time to do this research. Hours are precious. Show up as it opens, eat a quick lunch, and then go back and stay till it closes and have a scanner or some document camera, probably a scanner is best. And if you can get an assistant, maybe your spouse or some colleague or whatnot to scan while you look, you're going to really increase the amount of documents you can get. Um, I'm actually very upset myself because there are documents that that I wanted that I didn't get. Now, of course, the benefit is, is I'm gonna have to come back to Wilmington and visit the Hagley Library again, which is a nice trip. The question is, I'm not sure when I'll be able to do that. So just be prepared. It's going to be a lot of stuff and put as much effort as you can towards it. Well, that's really valuable advice. And Jeff, we look forward to seeing you at Hagley once again. And and thank you for speaking with me today. Oh, thank you very much. I had a good time. Well, that's great. And for the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts, more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online. You can visit hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger.